Hi there! This video will show the proof of Kepler's second and third laws of planetary motion using principles of vector calculus. Before we begin, let's quickly review what these three laws say and what was involved in proving the first law, as we will use some of the same concepts in the second and third laws. The first law says that a planet revolves around the Sun in an elliptical orbit with the Sun at one focus. The second law says that a line joining the Sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. And the third law says that the square of the period of revolution of a planet is proportional to the cube of the length of the major axis of its orbit. In quick notation, the planet's position vector is denoted by r, the velocity vector is denoted by v. So you can note that the velocity is the derivative of the position vector. One can prove the first law then by showing that r cross v is equal to a constant vector h, and then showing that the equation for this motion, by making the substitutions indicated in green, is the equation of an ellipse. This is the final equation that we end up with after proving the first law. It's important to remember that we are looking at r as a position defined by polar coordinates. This means that r is defined by an angle, theta, counterclockwise from the x, positive x-axis, and a length, radially outwards from the x-axis. The x-coordinate of r is equal to r cos theta, and the y-coordinate is equal to r sine theta in the i-hat direction and the, jet, in the j-hat direction, respectively. We say that r is dependent on theta and that theta is dependent on t. Therefore, in order to find the instantaneous velocity vector, we must differentiate r with respect to t. We then differentiate r by using the product rule to come up with the following expression. From this expression, our next step is to take the vector cross product of r cross v to determine an expression for the constant vector h. When carrying out the cross product of r and v, we know that the component in the i-hat direction is equal to the determinant of this matrix, and that the component in the j-direction is equal to the determinant of this guy and this one. So we can see that the components in the i and the j direction are equal to zero, and that if we can find an expression for the determinant of this matrix, it will give us the component in the k-hat direction. The expression for the determinant, once you make some cancellations and use the trigonometric identity sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals one, becomes h equals r squared d theta over dt in the k-hat direction. The fact that this is only in the k-hat direction makes sense, as Kepler's first law showed us that the position and the velocity only lie in the xy plane, and the cross product will give us a vector that is perpendicular to both the position and the velocity at all times. So now we have an expression for h, and we can deduce that the magnitude of h, because it's only in the k-hat direction, is equal to r squared d theta over dt. Our goal is now to use this expression to prove Kepler's second law, that the area swept out by r in a time t is a constant. Let's recall the expression for area in polar coordinates. Over a small interval d theta, the area dA swept out is equal to 1 half r squared d theta. We can now take the time derivative of both sides of the equation to come up with the expression dA over dt is equal to 1 half r squared d theta by dt. If we now recognize this guy as the expression that we came up with for the magnitude of h in our previous discussion, we can write dA over dt is equal to 1 half the magnitude of h. Because we know that h is a constant vector, we have essentially proven Kepler's second law that the line joining a planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Yay! Moving on to the third law. We are now going to use this expression to find an expression for the period of the orbit. So recall that the area of an ellipse with semi-major axis A, here along the x-axis, and semi-minor axis B is equal to pi AB. So for one complete orbit, the area swept out is pi AB, and the time taken is one orbital period, denoted here by capital T. If we rearrange this equation for h, we find that t is equal to 2 pi AB over h. Now let's go back to our original equation for r as an ellipse in polar coordinates. 
We're going to use these equations from Stewart's Value Transcendentals to complete our expression for the orbital period. These equations are used to relate the semi-major and the semi-minor axis of an orbit to the eccentricity, E, here, and the directrix, D. We will not be deriving these equations, but just for a quick explanation, the eccentricity here is the measure of how much an ellipse deviates from circular and it's calculated by this expression. Um, and the directrix is a line that lies outside the ellipse, and the ratio, of, the ratio of the distance of a point to the directrix and the point to a focus is a constant ratio. If we now remember back to the substitutions we made to get our original equation, we defined d as h squared over c and c as, and sorry, and e as c over g m where g and m are the gravitational constant and the mass of the sun, respectively. So from these guys here, we can easily see that e times d is equal to h squared over gm. And from these guys up here, we can see that b squared over a is equal to ed. So we can say that h squared over gm is equal to b squared over a which we will use to further simplify our expression for the period of the orbit. We now go back to our original expression for the period. By squaring both sides, we get this expression here. We can then make the substitution for h that we just determined, and voila! We now have an expression relating the period of the orbit to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis. Alrighty, before I leave you to go have fun calculating orbital periods, let's just review quickly how one would use this equation. A is equal to the length of the semi-major axis, indicated here, which is half the length of the major axis of the orbit. G is the gravitational constant equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meters per kilogram squared, and M for planets in our solar system is the mass of the sun. 1.99 times 10 to the power of 30 kilograms. That concludes our proof of Kepler's second and third laws. We have shown that the line joining a planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times, and that the square of the period of revolution of a planet is proportional to the cube of the length of its major axis. Here is the reference to the textbook that was used for some of the equations in this video. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed.